the, the key to this uh, and what makes this fundamentally different is that this provides the people who have the impetus to go and, and reach this content uh, and have the impetus to share this content with the ability to share it in a way that it actually reaches the, the intended targets. Welcome to Needlestack, the podcast for professional online research. I'm your host, Matt Ashburn. And I'm Jeff Phillips. Today, we're sitting down with Zhenya Simkin, co-founder of Samizdat Online, an anti-censorship tool that helps citizens in dictatorial regimes access news that's being blocked or censored. Zhenya, welcome to the show. Thank you both so much. And it's great to have you here. So, so Zhenya, you built this tool to subvert censorship by authoritarian regimes. Can you walk us through how that works and, and what you what you aim to gain from this? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So, so um, it's not just a tool, but the underlying technology um, creates a giant uh, distribution of completely ambiguous looking domain names through which we pipe uh, the content that is uh, censored in all of these regions. Uh, the underlying objective is simply to reacquaint the citizens of uh, the world, of which about 65% live in some manner of autocratic uh, darkness on the internet, uh, where their uh, leaders deem it necessary to protect them, quote unquote, from much of what the liberal media around the world uh, wishes for them to know. Uh, so it's a, it's a very... Uh, it, it, it just leverages the notion that uh, it's information needs to be free in order for a society to be free. Uh, and we simply take all the content that these autocrats ban and make it visible again to the citizens of these locales. Can you talk a little bit about um, how does that look or work from a user point of view? Is that is it something that they have to be technical to do. Yeah, so it the the mechanism is rooted very much in the original Samizdat ethos, which uh, the word comes from Soviet Russia, where people would smuggle illicit content, uh, literature, uh, news, obviously, but sometimes music and art, anything else that they could uh, get from outside the uh, Iron Curtain. And they would make their own copies of it, and then they would distribute it to their friends and whoever else was interested. And those people would make more copies and so on and so forth. So uh, there's, there was sort of a natural viral uh, distribution mechanism. And since social media has totally introduced everybody to this in a, in a, in a much more banal and, and uh, less uh, informationally critical uh, way, uh, we're taking advantage of the fact that the vast majority of the world is now quite familiar with distributing stuff amongst themselves. And so uh, the, in essence, we have a website, which is just a, a centrally, we actually employ journalists who source and look for interesting content from around the world, which is banned anywhere at all. Um, and people come to that site and they either get links directly to those sources. So they, they might find they, they, they will find their way to the front page of some news outlet that is banned, or they will get links to specific articles that we think are worth their attention. Um, and then those links, uh, we, we provide them with with the, the very, I mean, it's, it's not, when I say tools, I don't want to give anybody the impression that there's anything to download or anything to to install or anything like that. Tools meaning just web web tools that while, while they're on the web page, they push a button and they see a mechanism that lets them share it out to their social media, their email, wherever they want to share it. Um, and then those links are sent to, to their recipients and those recipients can send them on and on. And the, the, the most um, advantageous piece of this is that those links, once they're received, they can be clicked on by anyone, anywhere that there is an internet connection. Those recipients do not require any additional technology to, uh, to use those links. That's really interesting. And the, uh, so Samizdat uh, works it sounds like it's it's circumventing the the DNS blocking uh, by by these regimes. So Russia and Belarus, for example, both rely on DNS blocking or poisoning to to censor access to information. 
Are there any plans to adapt your technology if censorship uh, techniques evolve over time? Uh, there are, of course, plans of all kinds, and we do uh, actually just as as a as a bit of a lark, but also just to show that we are in fact using every possible tool to help people distribute information amongst themselves. Uh, every link that we have has a little QR code next to it, and if you tap on that QR code, it, it fills up your entire screen. And that way, if you're literally standing next to somebody, you know, in, in, in a nightclub or in an alley or whatever, they can just scan your phone and, and go to that, uh, to that website through the, so, so that isn't a direct answer to your question, but it, it, it uh, indicates our larger drive to, to circumvent all of these initiatives by these uh, autocrats in every way we can. The, the beautiful thing about DNS um, and I don't know to what extent your audience knows what that is, but I'll let you tell me if you want me to do a, a little bit of a tech lesson. But um, but the beautiful thing about DNS and and in internet technology writ large is that it's reasonably straightforward and pretty simple in in the grand scheme of things. And so the autocrats are actually quite limited in what they can do and what technology they can bring to bear to uh, thwart their citizens from visiting whatever it is they don't want them to visit unless they are willing to simply turn the internet off i mean that is their you know there's a they have a big lever and they can just shut the internet off in their nation and then their citizens can't get to the internet at all uh that is essentially what's happening in north korea which is our one kind of it's the one place we really cannot operate and have very few ideas as to what we could do additionally in north korea the citizens are subjected to such unbelievable punishment for any violation of anything. I, I, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want it on my soul to, uh, <laughs> to put anything in anybody's hands that could get them punished as badly as North Korea punishes people. But, um, but in most places, that's not how it works. In most places, the internet does exist to some degree. And so the, the blocking of DNS is pretty much the only thing that uh, the government can do. And for various technical reasons, blacklisting DNS, uh, blacklisting domain names in, in particular, is pretty much the only thing they can do. If they go to a whitelist, um, and again, just let me know. I'll 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 detail it to the, whatever degree you want in terms of exposition. Uh, whitelists are kind of unworkable and present additional overwhelming problems for the regime. That uh, it just you know to make a long story short, that's just not what they're going to do. So so blacklisting DNS is basically their their entire bag of tricks. Shifting a little bit from the technology. Um, so I was on the site. Um, you have a lot of different publications and articles. Um, can you tell us a little bit, you know, was it hard to convince these, these sources or these publications to work directly with you or grant you permission to uh, syndicate these articles? Uh, it was actually unbelievably easy once we had the right ears, and that seems to be the, the case for most uh, of uh, media. Uh, so, for example, we have yet to reach uh, the New York Times, for example, or, or uh, you know, The Guardian. These, these are very difficult places for us to penetrate, and so I don't believe anybody there has either heard about us or uh, knows that we're kind of desperately trying to get through to them to get their permission to do this. Um, meanwhile, the publications that are in, uh, and so just to be clear, we started in Russia because that's, per, it has a personal, uh, connection for me, uh, as my name might suggest, I'm, I'm from there originally. And, and I might have engineers who work for me who are there and in Ukraine. And so this, this was all a very, uh, you know, it was a very personal project initially. And then once we launched it, we quickly quick realized that, um, Russia is by no means, uh, <laughs> the only place on earth where this is ne needed. And so just recently we ventured into Iran. Uh, we're obviously, you know, heading towards China at some point in the not too distant future. But um, the the way that uh, it worked is that until I got in touch with our executive producer, Stas Kutcher, and our editor in chief, Anna Drubachova, uh, I didn't know them until I started this project. And, until, and so I thought, oh, I'll just try and reach these publications myself uh, with no direct linking to them. And that didn't work at all. They, it was it was just as hard, <laughs> and, and we, we were unable to do some. But the moment that uh, these two fine individuals joined our team, everything like the, everything fell like dominoes because they know they know these publications, they know the people who who ran them, run them. Uh, and the moment that these publications found out that we existed, they very eagerly 
asked us to please participate uh, to to help uh, distribute them to the world. Uh, so at this point, we actually uh, have many publications reaching out to us without us reaching out. Like the 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 the, the, the direction of who's asking whom for what has now shifted. <laughs> Where uh, several times a week we will receive requests on our website to unblock and and have people join us and stuff. That, which so it's been very heartening. That that's great. So they. The, it's from a, it's it comes to them uh, it's, it's a they buy into the greater good portion of it um i you know as compared to some of us could be cynical with media and news and it's all ad driven and things like that but hopefully they came at it from from a greater good perspective well it's, it, i think i mean if we i don't want to cast too many aspersions about incentives i understand how people make their money but uh i it, it, their incentive is that they're simply not seen like they were shut down right so one day they had an audience of some some millions of viewers per month, and the next day they had no audience, or 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 that audience was you know cut by eighty percent or whatnot. I think Medusa said that when 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 they were uh, cut off, they their audience went from twenty million to to five or something like that. So that's that's a substantial loss, and um, they were very very eager for us to. Um, um, we were careful with the word syndicate because it it, people know that word to mean something very particular as it relates to financial agreements and stuff. So we're, we're ju we just use the word unblock for now because there really is no word that truly describes what we're doing. So we're unblocking. I'm wondering, there are other tools out there that have tried to combat censorship in different ways. So for example, Tor is, is one of those, of course. Can you talk a bit about the approach that you've taken and how it differs from tools like Tor? Yeah, absolutely. So. Uh, VPN and Tor are fantastic tools uh, in their own right for um, specific access to specific things uh, or for anonymizing your uh, personality to some extent or what, what, whatever they do. Um, the, the key difference for us is that the, the nature of the way that the propaganda works uh, in everywhere, but certainly in Russia, is that the people who are keen to use Tor or keen to use VPN are people who are already most likely reasonably well informed. And so if my core objective is to reacquaint the population with ideas that they are being uh, protected from uh, and uh, to grant them an, an entry point that entry point is almost certainly going to come from their friends and neighbors and, and people they trust. But if somebody sends you something and says, here, take a look at this, but in order to take a look at this first, install this VPN or grab a Tor browser or whatever, the odds that you're going to do that are basically zero. So the, the, the key to this and what makes this fundamentally different is that this provides the people who have the impetus to go and, and reach this content uh, and have the impetus to share this content with the ability to share it in a way that it actually reaches the the intended targets um, so that there's the possibility that people who are not personally driven and not personally inclined to go seeking this information will will wind up in front of it anyway. Um, and, and then I'm not naive. I understand that just clicking on a link, especially in the media environment, which, which we live now, everybody is basically prepared to denounce everything as fake news and, and to assume that there's, you know, n nothing but um, bad faith actors in every corner of, of, of what they deem mainstream, like mainstream media is a dirty word. Um, but my belief is that there's, there has to be a point at which you just introduce some doubt in, into the, what is otherwise a completely hermetically sealed worldview. Um, and the moment that doubt exists, I mean, that's where everything starts, right? You start with a little bit of doubt and then people will gradually come off of the, you know, the, 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 the deep freeze that they're in will start to thaw is my hope. I mean, maybe I'm naive and maybe we're doomed, but you know, I got to do something. I, I don't think you're doomed. And I, I, uh, I get it that people are doubting everywhere, but you know, hopefully opening yourself up or opening people up to many more sources, even if you're the type that checks all sources um, to get different perspectives um, is, is got to be useful. But, you know, I know it's early days. Can you tell yet? Do you do you feel like your work is is having an impact on the, the war in Ukraine, I, whether that's disrupting narratives or, uh, you know, enabling people to, um, you know, start communicating in certain ways? I mean. Can you tell yet if you're uh, having an, having any impact? 
Um, there's really no way to measure direct impact. And honestly, I don't, until I, you know, we start hearing specific anecdotes of maybe, you know, specific soldiers who clicked on a link and saw something that, you know, changed their mind about they were going to do this. They decided to do that. So, I mean, like that, those, those kinds of stories are extremely hard to come yeah, by. Sure. Um, and uh, I, I don't doubt that that happens. Uh, I don't know if it's because of us. I don't doubt that it happens in general. Um, I'm I- extremely... Uh, driven to add to the mix, you know, so, so the, more is more, as they say. So it, the, the, the service is being utilized uh, with some reasonably uh, serious gusto by our estimation, simply because we have not promoted it yet. Like we've, we've basically just launched it. Uh, and, and so we're, we're being very careful about how we introduce it to the world uh, because we need to be sure that we're ready to withstand both the, uh, the massive traffic that we're going to encounter once people start using it to view everything that we are unblocking, right? Because if you put, if you aggregate all of this unblockable content and then run it through our servers, which they need to do, then we're talking about, you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions of, of visits to what is essentially us, even though it's ultimately not us, right? We're just the intermediary, but, but we still have to ma- be able to manage all that traffic. So, and, and then of course, um, I don't actually believe that the Ruskin Nazor or the Iranian mullahs or anybody else has caught wind of us yet. But when they do, they're going to come after us with a fury as well, right? Because then, and then that, that game of whack-a-mole will begin and we'll have to be sure that we can stay ahead of them. So because we are very young and unfunded at this point and we're, you know, we're, we're very scrappy, but there's a lot to be done and, and, and we're doing our best to roll things out as quickly as possible. Um, so we're very careful as to... The, the the rate at which we venture into the world. So we haven't been doing any advertising and we haven't, we, we, so in terms of how, who knows about us mm-hmm. and what kind of traffic it's generated, we put up a link on a, a public interest kind of, it's not even a news site, it's, it's a site in Belarus called Cuckoo, which is a just lifestyle publication essentially. And they had uh, traffic, I don't want to lie, but I think it's somewhere in the neighborhood of, Two million users, um, something like wow. that. I, I, I'm, I'm afraid to say say the wrong numbers, but but it's something like that. And based on our um, based on what we're seeing, essentially all of their users came to us, wow. um, or 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 something like that, mm-hmm. right? Even though all they did was on their front page, they put up uh, a notice that please you please use this service to get to us, and everyone has. So if that's any kind of indication of uh, how how this will uh, be utilized by the, the wider globe, then, you know, all I could say is, oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> yes, you can. that is definitely what you should say. Absolutely. Yeah. So, Jenny, as we start to wrap up today, uh, what would you like to leave the audience with? What 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 final thought would you like to have? Oh my God. So many final thoughts. Um, well, okay. So I have my main final point, (laughs) maybe not my final, final point, uh, is that I wish everybody would take the temperature down on everything a lot. I think that there's, uh, the, the way that we consume our media drives our cortisol in a way that everybody is then constantly ginned up and, and in a frenzy about everything. Uh, and, and, and as Jeff, mentioned earlier that the incentives of the media is in fact to do exactly that because that's exactly how they get people to click on things and that's how they make their money. Um, but that creates a, uh, an environment in w- w- which I refer to as the age of Babel, where there is absolutely no, there's absolutely no trust in anything because there's just too much. There's, so there's such an overwhelming fire hose of information from every side. And anybody who's looking to validate something or verify something or try to get to the bottom of something quickly finds that even when they're at the bottom of whatever it is, they're still quote unquote experts in whatever it is that vehemently disagree with each other. Right. So, and so like, for example, I can't be an expert in anything but my craft, right? Like this, there's just too many things in which to be an expert. And so when people, uh, when people turn to other experts for whatever it is that they have to trust them in their expertise, uh, they find that there isn't a consensus there and then they feel hopeless, right? And and so w- when this pertains to what's the best coffee to drink, you know, there's nothing really at stake. But when this pertains to what's the best treatment for your colon cancer, then then things become a little more dicey <laughs> um, and everything in between. 
So uh, my my wish, I don't know if it's my advice, but my wish is that people would just take take it, take everything with a grain of salt, but at the same time, not ascribe malice to everything and assume that there's, you know, there's a lot of incompetence, but, but also there's a lot of goodwill. And most people just want what's best. We were, when people say we're really divided, we're not really divided. Most people want mo more or less exactly the same thing, right? They want, they, they want their kids to have the, a better life than they did. Uh, they want to feel safe when they go out into the streets. They want to not worry that tomorrow there's going to be a famine or another pandemic or that someone's going to drop a bomb on their head. Um, those are pretty universal desires. <laughs> so, um, so I just wish everybody would tone it down and, and, and give, it, give each other a big hug uh, and, and, and stop, stop it with, the, with, with, the, um, with all of this. <laughs> I, I, I know that sounds naive and cliche and banal, but I don't know. That... No, no, I was saying I think that's a, a fantastic thought to, to end on there. Uh, so, so really do appreciate it. And uh, thank you very much for, for joining us today. Thank you both for in inviting me and, and, and spreading the word about our product. And, uh, you know, let's, let's, uh, let's make the world a better place. That sounds great. And for those folks at home, if you liked what you heard, you can always subscribe to our show wherever you get your podcasts. You can also watch episodes of our show on YouTube and view transcripts and other information on our website at authenticate.com slash needle stack. That's authentic with a number eight dot com slash needle stack. Also be sure to follow us on Twitter at needle stack pod. And we'll be back next time with more on fact checking and debunking. We'll see you then. Uh -huh.